Hi there. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is. As always, happy whatever day it is you're watching this. Welcome to episode 64 of Left Side of the Aisle. Will you still love me when I'm 64? Uh, this is for the week of July 5th through 11th, 2012. I'm your host. My name's Larry Erickson. And for about the next eh, nearly half an hour, uh, I'm going to be your ranter and raconteur, talking about things important to me I think deserve your attention. If um, you have any comments, questions, whatever, as always, they should be sent to me directly. My email address is whoviating, W-H-O-V-I-A-T-I-N-G, at AOL.com. And my website, Lotus Surviving a Dark Time, will be up over here a couple of times during the show. And if you can catch the email address, um, you can get it there. Uh, I do answer my email. I'm sometimes a little slow about it, but I do answer it. I just ask that um, if you send me email, that you please include something like left side of the aisle or your cable show or something like that in the subject line so that I know it's not spam. All right, with that, I've got uh, several things to talk about today, so I want to get right to it. Uh, the first is that you probably wondered, if you saw last week's show, why I didn't talk about the Supreme Court decision about the uh, Affordable Health Care Act, or Obamacare, as it's more popularly known. I mean, that was, after all, the big, important domestic news of the week. Well, the answer is simple. The show's done on Wednesday, and the decision came down on Thursday. That's why. So I'm going to talk about it now. Uh, First, I want to say I'm not going to refight the issue of the health care law. I'm not. I do want to note uh, that when this whole thing was being debated, uh, according to polls taken at the time, somewhere upwards of 20% of Americans, which is more than a third of those who say they are opposed to this bill, were actually opposed to it because it wasn't good enough. It didn't go far enough in regulating the insurance uh, industry. It didn't go far enough in regulating the drug companies. Didn't go far enough toward a single payer system or a national health care system. Uh, I was among that 20%. But this is what we got, and we've got to try to make this work as best as we can. All right, so getting to the decision, you probably know that the Supreme Court upheld the law by a vote of five to four, uh, largely because um, Chief Justice John Roberts was persuaded that the mandate, the individual mandate, which requires you to either have health insurance coverage or to pay a penalty, uh, he was um, uh, convinced that that could be regarded as a tax rather than as an exercise of Congress's authority to regulate interstate commerce. So he stood with the four moderate justices, and I call them moderate, I don't call them liberals, I call them moderates. That is uh, Breyer, Kagan, Sotomayor, and Ginsburg. He stood with them uh, to uphold the law on the basis that the mandate was a tax. Now, the, oh, by the way, those other four, they agreed it could be seen as a tax, but they said they would have upheld it under the Commerce Clause powers too, but... Uh, that's neither here nor there, really, because uh, Roberts became the controlling opinion because he was the fifth vote. Now, there are a couple of odd things about the, um, about the decision here. The first is just the idea of the lineup of the majority. I mean, John Roberts making common cause with those other four is odd. A lot of people have wondered why, uh, why Roberts went the way he did. Um, obviously, nobody knows, uh, with the probable exception of John Roberts. Um, I personally, though, have, have a suspicion. I'm just, just idle speculation, that's all it is. But I can't help but wonder if John Roberts is starting to think about what the legacy of the Robert Courts will be, the historical legacy. I mean, you know, we've had the Rehnquist Court, the Burger Court, the Warren Court, now we've got the Roberts Court. And this court is seen almost universally as the most ideologically riven and from the right ideologically driven Supreme Court uh, in memory and possibly in our nation's history. And I'm beginning to wonder if John Roberts is just beginning to think about he doesn't know that he wants the Roberts court to go down in history as the most fractured court in our history. Um, so maybe he's, at least for his own legacy, trying to think that how he can be seen, even just for himself, as the person who's prepared to, if you will, reach across the aisle. I mean, that's just speculation on my part, but we'll see in future decisions. All right, there's a second odd thing here, a second odd thing. 
The minority, who consisted of four members of the court's reactionary wing, uh, that is Thomas, Alito, Scalia, and Kennedy, whose reputation as a middle-of-the-roader has gotten quite threadbare of late, um, those four would have tossed out the entire law, the entire thing from beginning to end. In fact, they argued, this is where it gets weird, they argued that even the constitutional provisions of the law had to be thrown out with what they said was the unconstitutional part because, quoting them, the act's other provisions would not have been enacted without the mandate. In other words, they're saying that no part of this bill would have been passed without the mandate. So, and, and they somehow, they know this. So that even what's lawful has to be tossed out, including provisions that have already gone into effect, which obviously don't depend on the mandate because the mandate's not in effect yet. Um, and all because these four know what laws Congress would or would not have passed under a different set of circumstances. In fact, they went on to say that, I'm quoting here, it makes enactment of sensible health care regulation more difficult. That is, it's not the bill that they would have passed. The sensible regulations, and how's that for right-wing corporate speak? The sensible regulations that they would have passed. And after all this, they had the goal to accuse the majority of vast judicial overreach. That is, in essence, they were accusing the majority of being activist judges who wanted to legislate from the bench. Just unbelievable. Just unbelievable. There's another part of the, minority de uh, the majority decision, rather, that got less attention, at least initially, but could have a major impact on people who currently lack access to health care, and were at least hopeful that this new law would change that. See, the law calls for an expansion of Medicaid. That's the program designed to provide health access, health insurance coverage to the poor. The expansion would bring an estimated 17 million people who now do not have health care coverage into the Medicaid program. Now, the majority of the Supreme Court upheld the program, but with a caveat. They said that the federal, this is a new program, and because of that, uh, the federal government cannot threaten states that don't comply with the expansion with loss of their Medicare, uh, uh, Medicaid funding rather, under the existing program. Essentially, that means that the expansion of Medicaid is now optional for the states. And a number of them, under the reign of right-wing governors and or legislatures, are already making noises about refusing. This could mean, this could mean that millions of Americans with low incomes who don't now qualify for their state's uh, Medicaid, uh, Medicaid uh, 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 coverage, it leaves them almost literally stuck between a rock and a hard place. They're still required to have health insurance or pay a penalty if they don't have it, um, but they can't afford the insurance. Or, even worse, uh, they could wind up with low-cost, high-deductible plans that basically do them no good because while they can afford the premiums, they can't afford the deductibles, so they get no benefit from the plans, in effect leaving them worse off than they were before. Now, some experts think that that's a minor issue because they said the federal government's uh, incentives, incentives and subsidies to take part in the plan are so good that, um, well, in the words of Wharton School health economist Mark Pauley, most people don't expect any of them to opt out unless they were ideologically driven. Unfortunately, Mr. Pauley, that's exactly the point. All right, there's a couple of other things I want to mention that this decision raised before I move on. Once, once again, um, the minority said the Affordable Health Care Act makes enactment of sensible health care regulations more difficult. All right? Now, the whole sentence was, it makes enactment of sensible health care regulation more difficult since Congress cannot start afresh but must take as its point of departure a jumble of now senseless provisions, provisions that certain interests favored under the court's new design will struggle to retain. Now, in the context of the entire law being upheld, that sentence makes no sense. It really doesn't. You know, there was some delay in announcing this decision. It was put off a couple of times. And I, I've been wondering if there are actually arguments and negotiations until the very, very last, literally the last minute. Because the statement I just quoted and the discussion that the minority had that surrounded this um, would make sense if and only if 
The minority thought the majority were going to strike down the mandate but leave the rest of the law intact. I really wonder if until the very last minute the minority knew what Roberts was actually going to argue. Now the other thing, the one other thing I have to mention here, and this is important, the minority raised the issue of state sovereignty in this. This is the second time this has come up very recently. The other was in the Arizona uh, immigration law uh, case. The thing is that the, um, the, the, the right wing on the Supreme Court believes that the federal government is one of, and they say this repeatedly, limited powers. Now, by limited, the thing is they don't mean that there are limits. They mean limited, few powers. And the rest of the powers are reserved to the states. Uh, the, court, the court's right wing is clearly moving toward, and in fact some of them have already embraced, a radical notion of states' rights of the sort that, frankly, was one of the precipitating factors of the Civil War. This is something that seriously bears watching. Okay, we're going to move on from there to our regular weekly feature, the outrage of the week. Uh, Republicans have said repeatedly that what they call Obamacare must be repealed and replaced. But if you ask them replaced with what, well, the Double Talk Express gets rolling. Uh, this past Sunday, uh, eight, uh, uh, July 1st, uh, Senator Mitch Fishface McConnell was on Fox News Sunday. Host Chris Wallace asked him how, um, if Obamacare is repealed, how Republicans would provide health care coverage to the estimated 30 million Americans who, uh, who it's estimated would get coverage under the new plan. Uh, McConnell answered, that's not the issue. Incredulous, Wallace, Wallace interrupted him. He said, you mean 30 million uninsured is not an issue? Well, Fishface responded by spouting out bullet points and, and sound bites about how bad Europe is and about how Obama wants the federal government to take over all of American health care, which, frankly, I sometimes wish it would because that couldn't be worse than what we have now. Um, well, and then Wallace pressed McConnell on the issue of pre-existing conditions. How would you protect the people who now can't get insurance because of pre-existing conditions? Well, Fishface dismissed the whole issue. He referred to state-level high-risk pools, which don't exist in every state, provide, provide uh, uh, limited coverage with high premiums, waiting periods, and coverage exclusions. And in fact, they now serve about 208,000 people when there's about 25 million who face problems because of pre-existing conditions. You know, this debate has been going on for how long now? And, and I mean the debate about this particular piece of legislation. I don't mean the whole health care debate. This particular piece of legislation. The debate's been going on for more than three years. And yet after all that time, the blockheads that populate the right wing still don't have any alternative plans. They still sink, don't have a single actual program to deal with the scores of millions of Americans who lack access to health care. Now we know why. For them, that's not an issue. And that is an outrage. The outrage of the week. All right, now, believe it or not, we're going to move on to another award. Uh, in this case, it's the Clarabelle Award. And this is going to be a regular feature of the show. It wasn't supposed to be. It was supposed to be an occasional feature. Um, but now I'm saying it's going to be a regular one. Uh, I won't say there'll be one every week. So, well, I, so actually I should say instead of a regular feature, I should say a frequent feature of uh, Left Side of the Aisle because there are just too many clowns out there. This week's dishonoree is the organization One Million Moms, this paranoid homophobic group of wackos who are convinced that the gays are out to get us. I mean, they really are a bunch of loony losers. This is the outfit that back in February uh, called for a nationwide boycott of J.C. Penney because the chain had hired Ellen DeGeneres to be their spokeswoman in their commercials. This was so successful that in March they dropped the whole thing, uh, saying other issues required the group's attention. Some of those issues... Well, in February, they threatened Toys R Us with a boycott because they carried the issue of Archie Comics that had that same-sex wedding that I actually mentioned a couple of weeks ago. I noticed, by the way, they didn't call for a boycott of the comic. They probably figured that was a lost cause. 
Uh, in April, they, they condemned Urban Outfitters for showing a lesbian couple in its catalog. And in May, they slammed DC Comics and Marvel Superheroes Comics for introducing gay characters. So I suppose it's really no surprise that uh, just last week, this concatenation of flakes was all a quiver over this. It's exactly what it looks like. It's a rainbow Oreo cookie. And more exactly, it's not a cookie. It's an image that was unveiled on the company's Facebook page last week. It's an ad. But it was an ad that was put up in support of Pride Month. And no one, including Oreo, uh, denies that broader meaning. Makes the point simply, clearly, and in fact, the image has gone viral. And one million bomb just can't contain itself, ranting and raving about the imminent demise of human civilization, or at least of American civilization, which, of course, is the only one that counts. Uh, you know, in a way, it's easy to feel sorry for one million moms. I mean, just, just figure recently, JCPenney, Toys R Us, Archie Comics, Urban Outfitters, DC Comics, Marvel Comics, and now even Oreo cookies bear the mark of evil. They really must feel the world is collapsing around them, which, happily, it is. Now, One Million Moms, um, which is part of the even more deeply disturbed American Family Association, uh, helpfully notes that Oreos are made by Kraft Foods, which has other brands, including Cadbury, Maxwell House, and Nabisco. Well, thank you for that information, One Million Moms, and I'll be sure to keep it in mind when I do my shopping. That bit of helpful information, however, does not change the fact that you and your organization and all of your members are complete and total clowns. And we are going to take a break. Here we are, back again. Um, this show will be seen in the week following the 4th of July. So I hope you enjoyed your fourth. I hope you got to see some fireworks or go to a barbecue or watch a parade or just hang out in your yard or loll on your couch with a, with a cool drink. Um, the fourth is a time for fun, and I hope you had your share of it. It's also a time, traditionally, uh, for uh, a day of patriotism, a day to celebrate our nation and our nation's heritage. The thing is, too many people, especially among politicians, make patriotism a matter of, like, ostentatious display. Uh, flag pins and the Star Spangled Banner and swirling music. Uh, in fact, the next time you see a political debate, amuse yourself by noting how many of the men are dressed in red, white, and blue. Red tie, white shirt, blue suit. Well, I say that patriotism, measured in terms of wearing flag pins and all of that, uh, of having your heart, uh, hand over your heart to the national anthem and so on, that that patriotism measured that way is worthless, dangerous, and hollow. It is a shallow patriotism, a shell that refers substance, uh, prefers appearance to substance. And too easily, as we've seen too often over the past years, uh, slides from patriotism into jingoism. Now, note well, I am not saying that wearing a flag pin is shallow. Wearing a flag pin may well be an outward expression of an inward commitment. I'm saying that patriotism measured in those terms is shallow, and it is. All right, so this is my understanding of patriotism. In addition to embracing the comment I read some years ago that it is natural to have an abiding affection for the land of one's birth, I say being a U.S. patriot means being dedicated to the ideals on which the country was supposed to have been founded, and which at its best moments it strives to uphold in as full a measure as it can. Ideals such as life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, as the right and duty to rebellion against oppression, as promoting the general welfare, as political freedoms, as representative government of, by, and for the people. The ideal of, to sum it up in a single phrase, of the intent to establish justice. A justice, I say, must include the economic and social as well as the political if it's to have any real meaning. Patriotism, patriotism lies in the ideals and the commitment to the ideals, not in any symbolic outward expression of it. True patriotism is an expression of the commitment to those internal ideals. Uh, use an example, uh, somebody who was an opponent of the Iraq War, who was outraged by the executive branch's usurpation of authority, is more of a patriot 
frankly, than a war supporter who kept going on about how George Bush was the commander in chief and we just had to do what we were told like we were all soldiers required to obey instead of a free people with the duty of a free people to question authority. Now, I don't wear a flag pin. I don't put my hand over the heart, uh, over my heart during the national anthem, um, which, in fact, I was taught as a child is something that some people do and some people didn't, but isn't required. Uh, I don't sing along with the national anthem. In fact, although I know some people will say I'm undermining my own argument, I actually don't even stand up for the national anthem. I don't do any of that stuff. But if patriotism can be understood as embracing the ideals of our nation, as striving to hold this country to the highest of those ideals instead of the lowest of its prejudices and fears, if patriotism can be understood as a commitment to the notion of what the U.S., of what we as a people can be and have at times approached being, then I say to you that I'm as patriotic as they come. And I have neither patience nor tolerance for those who would make patriotism a matter of gestures and decorations rather than of conviction and action. And I have even less tolerance and patience for those who would try to prove their patriotism by impugning mine. Now the truth is even many professional grouches, like me for example, are actually unregenerate romantics. Our sharp words are honed on the inexplicable, indefensible, but unshakable belief that things not only should be, they can be better than they are. I said to somebody some time ago that our strongest, surest beliefs are those we don't even know we have until we find them there within us. The point is our deepest, our most abiding convictions and beliefs are not born consciously of, of detailed philosophical argument and reason analysis. They grow naturally out of our deepest convictions. Now, those philosophical arguments and so on, they may give form to that convictions. They may give them substance and direction, but they don't drive them. They're driven by them. So, despite my tendency to intellectualization, to argue my points rationally with facts and figures and references, and because remember, one, one of my all-time favorite quotes is, passion and substance are not mutually exclusive. Despite my tendency to uh, go, well, here's the data, here's the logic, here's the conclusion, it is still important at times for me, at least, if for no one else, to drop away from all that and to say, here's the, just the baseline position where all you can say is, I believe. I believe that life is our highest good and advancing life is our highest ideal. I believe that whatever advances life, whatever improves life, is an expression of our humanity, that self-awareness, that capacity for love, that reach for hope, that separates, separates us from the other animals of this earth. I believe that which opposes life, that which advances hunger, oppression, and death, are a rejection of our humanity, a rejection of what it is to be human. I believe that to be human is to reach for our potential. I believe in family, in a broad, deep sense of family. A family is based on commitments, not on ceremonies, on ties of the heart, not on ties of the blood. I believe we must reach beyond the personal to the public, beyond self to others, beyond us and them to we, beyond the individual to the community, beyond the community to the community of humankind. I believe we must ultimately reject the right of so few to have so much when so many have so little. We must ultimately resist the power of so few to control so much when so many control so little. I believe in the right of every human being to a decent life, free of hunger, fear, and oppression. I believe in the duty of the society and of every individual member of that society to strive to guarantee that right to all others. I believe that while we should have no desire to place a ceiling over anyone's aspirations, that we should desire to put a floor under everyone's needs. I believe ultimately in justice. Not in idealized utopias, but in simple justice. A justice that rejects the ascendancy of bombs over bread, of private greed over public good, of profits over people. I support a justice that centers on the preciousness of life. A justice that embraces the economic and the social and the political, like I said before. And finally, I believe in the indivisibility of that justice. It must be justice for them, the same as for us. For enemy, the same as for friend. Or it's not justice, it's just favoritism. Now, I may sound like a philosopher, but the fact is what I'm interested in is change. Uh, not slogans, not philosophies, but getting the job done tight change. That means being hard-nosed, being practical in our work. 
The Italian pacifist Anilio Dolci famously said, faith does not move mountains. Work, exacting work, moves mountains. But when I say practical, I don't mean it in the sense of, you know, the, 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 the liberals, the so-called progressives, the Obama bots. Those people who lower their sights, harden their hearts, darken their vision, and then pat themselves on the back for their realism. You know the saying, I dream, dream of, of things that never were, and ask, why not? What we need to do is dream dreams of things that never were, and ask, how? How? What are the practical steps we can take today towards those ends? We have to approach the world with steel in our eyes. But at the same time, we can't let the steel in our eyes cloud the dream in our hearts. We have to hold to the vision of what we as a people, what we as a nation can be, what we can do, and not settle, as so many do, for the mere hope that it will get no worse or even more that it will just get worse more slowly. We need to be steely-eyed dreamers because achieving the kind of wide-ranging justice that humans deserve will not be easy. It will not be cheap. It will not be convenient. But ultimately, it is the right thing to do. And that is what I believe. Now, I tried to be a steely-eyed dreamer over my life with varying degrees of success. Um, usually, unfortunately, it's a little too long in the steel and a little too short in the dream, which unfortunately made unnecessary compromise a little too easily and risk a little too... Well, risky. I've come to a point in my life where I've started to slow down. I, I haven't spent as much time in the streets as I, as I used to or as much as I'd like to. My energy level simply isn't what it was. Um, and in fact, that um, I'm also finding as I slow down that maybe for just that reason that I'm looking, more, I'm looking less to the steel and more to the dream. But I have to admit, I'm finding it harder and harder to keep my spirits up. And there are discouraged days when I feel happy that I will not live to see the world I see coming at such times. But the thing is, despite it all, despite all the logic, despite a mountain of evidence, despite having no good reason to think so, I still believe that things not only should be, that they can be better than they are. I just do. I believe and I will continue to believe. That's it for me. I'm done. I'm out of here. Um, again, I hope you had a great fourth. Um, but for now, I will see you next week. And you just have the best week you possibly can. And you continue to believe. <laughs>